After the police had arrested and questioned Benjamin, a team of detectives in two vans took him up to Hendon to search his home for stolen documents. There they saw Pell's unique filing system at first hand. We're trying to recover anything relating to Harkavies, dignitaries and sensitive information. So I gave them quite an old pass. And then he also took a recent pile at random. And as you know, I used, I used the dining room as my faxing room and my photocopying room. So one of the clever CID officers, if that isn't a t t t is now a contradiction in terms, said, whoa, what is, what, what, you have a computer in there. What do you have in there? I said, well, I just use that for the internet. And he walks in there and he sees all my stuff from that week. So he gets all of my Oasis stuff. He gets two or three of my, and he gets a, a good stuff in there. And he also gets my stuff relating to West Yorkshire police. I thought, let's be clever here. Let's try and get them out of this room, because otherwise they're going to take every pal out of here and they're going to find everyone. Let's get them into the shed, because I knew once people are in the shed, they'll give up. As I understand from the, from the police at the moment, he has at his home, or has had at his home, subject to destruction now, something in the order of two million documents. Amongst the two million was a letter from Benja's GP, stating that he had been prescribed medication for his obsessional condition. So as soon as they open the shed door, everything comes crashing upon poor Lee Clements. It's only about five foot three in the first place. He said, what the hell have you got in here? He said, well, I told you, I'll keep all of the really sensitive stuff in here as well. You know, the really sensitive stuff. He said, well, there's no way we can go through all of this. <laughs> so he said, fine, it's okay, so I can close the door again. By the way, I say to them, you know, I, you know, I know you think this is a bit crazy, but I am actually certifiable and stuff, and I can get, uh, you know, I've, I've had, you know, I'm mad, basically, and they said, you don't need us to tell, you, you don't need to tell us that, we can see that. And then suddenly this letter drops out of this pile. The letter's diagnosis allowed the police to treat Pell as a nutcase collector, not a peddler of information. He was charged with stealing documentary waste. The more serious half of his criminal enterprise, his trade with Fleet Street, was not investigated. We, however, did present some of the evidence of this trade to Michael Coleman. We asked him to look at an invoice for a couple of feeder pieces. Well, he seems to be doing reasonably well from it. If the stories planted by Harkovies were fakes, News International journalists may have been duped too. For material on Aitken and two other pieces, Pell received over £3,000. Of the three stories, only Hackney Council is not represented by Harkovies. Do we know what Hackney means? I think that was Hackney Council. Pell was bailed to appear at Blackfriars Crown Court in November 1999 on charges of stealing documentary waste. He pleaded guilty. You will be put on a curfew and you will remain in your home between 8pm and 8am. If found on the streets you will be liable to arrest and you should rid your home of all the waste you have collected before sentencing on December the 13th. This offence is far more serious than it appears on the surface. The judge's curfew order and threat of imprisonment had a dramatic effect on Pell. For a few rare moments in his frenzied life, he became speechless and still. By the time he left court, he was back in character, clutching a plastic bag and sporting a hastily concocted disguise. Benji did a runner from the camera he'd recently welcomed. He also acquired an agent, John Mappin, who doubled as a high-tackling minder. Mappin joined in the chaos. We decided to see whether Benji would obey the curfew. He soon emerged unrepentant from his house, pulled on the rubber marigold gloves and drove away on his nightly round. No judge's order could override a Pell obsession. Once again, we tried to persuade him to resume cooperation in this program, but without success. When he realized that we were filming him, he feared that we might expose his curfew breaking to the judge. Do you want me to continue being able to do what I do? Well, I don't get all moralistic on me, okay? Because they don't, they don't give a fuck. I'm just shitting myself that next Monday this man is going to send me to prison. Look, I'm worried that next Monday I'm going to be in Pendleville, okay? Okay. On the 13th of December, Pell returned to Blackfriars Crown Court for sentencing. Mr. Pell, you are well aware now that what people throw away still belongs to someone, and that when they put discarded paper among their rubbish, that still belongs to them. I don't think I need say anything further. 
you will be fined 20 pounds to be paid at 10 pounds per week. First payment, 8th of January next year. The tender-hearted payment plan was tailored to Benjamin's claim in court that he lived off a 10 pound a week handout from his father. No mention was made of his annual estimated income of 100,000 pounds a year. So now I have a late trip of the Sunday Times going, and then obviously now I was able to sell all of my other Wall Street stories. By the spring of 2000, Pell was expanding his activities beyond show business, and his name was linked to a series of major news stories that rocked both of the country's main political parties. All these high-profile stories have been attributed to Pell, but ironically, the very newspapers that so fearlessly expose the truth about others will reveal nothing to us about their own sources. So was he the man behind the Michael Ashcroft, Lord Levy and Philip Gould stories? The word on the Fleet Street grapevine is yes. Eventually details of his bin raiding activities began to appear as newspapers which had once gratefully accepted the morsels which he threw their way now bit the hand that fed them right up to the armpit. The Mail on Sunday, once an outlet for Pell's stories, turned on him and suddenly, after years of surreptitiously supplying the news, Benji was the news. But nobody was prepared to break ranks and admit what was going on. So who did leak all those extremely damaging memos from Downing Street? Max Clifford, Britain's most famous publicist, that's who, at least that's what The Guardian says on its front page this morning. And where did Mr Clifford get them? Well, from Benji, the bin man. Well, Mr Clifford is on the line, so is the Labour MP, Dennis McShane. Have they got you bang to rights, Mr Clifford? <laughs> no, no, not at all. It's a great story, but unfortunately it's got nothing to do with reality. Well, none of it? No. So there you are, Dennis McShane, not true. It's not a laughing matter, this. This is about a newspaper organisation paying out large sums of money to Mr Pell. Do you think they're doing that, Mr Clifford? Um, well, I mean, more than likely. I mean, that's the way the game works these days. Well, Trevor Kavanagh is the political editor of The Sun. Guilty as charged, Trevor Kavanagh? The suggestion by Dennis McShane that we are repeatedly handing over large cheques to Mr Pell, uh, in this case, is absolutely wrong. Not a penny has changed hands. So I have to ask you where you got the documents, then? Of course you do. And you won't tell me? I won't. Well, all, all we know about this Benjamin Pell character is that he's caused all of this trouble. Those stories came and went, but Benji's longest-running exclusive is still ongoing, his alleged involvement in the case of Neil Hamilton and Mohammed Al-Fayed. After Hamilton had sued Al-Fayed for libel and lost, many observers commented on the extraordinarily confident performance which Al-Fayed had given when in the witness box. Could it be mere coincidence that, shortly before the trial began, Benji had been raiding the bins of Neil Hamilton's barristers? The self-styled victims of these thefts did agree to talk to us. I've often wondered what he looked like. You know, we heard a marvellous story the other day that the security porters at Grey's Inn, where our QC is, um, they know Pal very well. And for years they've been waving at him as he comes through the door. They thought he was part of the cleaning firm. And he's been saying good evening to them and they've been saying good evening. And they now know that they've been letting him in to rummage through the dustbins. But I think... It's a funny old world. It's a funny old world, a funny old guy. <laughs> Honestly, I would I can hardly keep my hands off his photograph, never mind if I actually had the man sitting here. Well, he devastated our lives, this man. The Mail on Sunday claimed that documents stolen were fired by a, a third party for £10,000. Mr Al Fayed refutes these allegations. I still owe my own solicitors three quarters of a million. Um, you know, we're talking about, say, £3 billion altogether. We so, face complete financial ruin and, and bankruptcy for Neil. The Mail on Sunday story gave them one more straw to clutch at. We've had some front pages we don't like the look of, but that one's <laughs> great. He uh, acted, in effect, as Benjamin Pell's fence. He took the documents to Fired, got money in exchange, and took it back to Pell. So he wasn't acting as a journalist in that respect, he was acting as a handler of stolen goods. Pell alleges that the third party only gave him £5,000, keeping the other five for himself. His screams of protest reached the mail on Sunday. I believe that this is why the story actually got out, ultimately. Um, the thieves quarrelled amongst themselves, and Pell thought that he should have been paid more for 
the documents that he provided. All of these journalists, complete bastards, get an interview with you, you give them a front page in their paper, and then they're willing a week later to shaft you. I've been fighting this case now for nearly six years, and we've had the most astonishing ups and downs and twists and turns. And this is the most astonishing of them all. But, you know, I'm the one who's being accused of greed, corruption, dishonesty, lying. And uh, I'm surrounded, then, by all these crooks and liars. And hypocrites. This and press. Wallowing around in this cesspit. From this cesspit, Neil Hamilton still hopes to overturn the jury's verdict that he took bribes from Al Fayed. Our solicitor calculated that if we'd had to destroy all the, pa all the excess paperwork, just in our case alone, it would have cost an extra £75,000. I we'll hope to... now that our, our, all the lawyers involved in our case will be doubly careful, even if it means they have to employ somebody extra well, to, to do the shredding. It cost you a fortune to produce to the documents yeah. in the first place, and then it cost you a fortune to destroy them. I mean, that's, they do... that's what the law's all about, of course. Yet, astonishingly, despite the widespread publicity given to Benji's bin raiding activities, many firms of agents and solicitors are still being just as careless with their clients' confidential documents as ever. My advice to solicitors and PR companies across London, even vaguely associated with celebrities or show business or music industry, would be get a shredder and get a shredder fast and start using it really quickly. Because there are many people that he's told me that he's stung for information with documents that have just been left on the pavement and he's gone back time and time again. You may think it's all over for Benji but it's only just begun. Shed number two is currently under construction and his appetite for making the news is greater than ever. Benji's gonna be over the back fence when he thinks no one's looking and at it again. Because that's Benji's kick, he loves it. I need new targets, I'm, you know, I need people to give me targets. I think they should tag him. At the end of the day though, I don't, I can't offer the papers anything if I can't do what I do. Simple as that. He comes across as eccentric, uh, mad, scatty, uh, but at the same time quite lovable. He's very childlike. It's very clever. It's very ingenious. He gets away with it. In small doses, brilliant. It's doubtless that he was working hard. He was making a living for himself. And to some extent, one has to look up to that. Thank you, Mr. Powell. But my main source of income is new stuff. A continual flow of new stuff. The latest Spice Girl stuff, the latest Liam stuff, the latest Lord Bell stuff, the latest stuff about Monsanto. That's the thing, and that definitely they won't have any more from me if my activities are over. The old saying, every dog should have his day, sounds good, but here's a person who's had two years and is still running around the block. Have you sold your story to the Sandwich? Today with four, keeping things scandalous. Richard Blackwood is back with him are the Sugar Babe, Charlene Spiteri and Sonique. Hanging with the ladies next.